five past, so let's crack on. And then if anyone else wants to arrive, hopefully they'll not, um, they'll not miss it. Um, so thank you very much to everyone who's joined us for this um, event tonight. My name's Frank McGuinness. I'm a practicing barrister. I'm called to the Bar of England and Wales. And I'm also a co-founder of the London Learning Cooperative um, and the Materialist Lawyers Group who are co-hosting tonight's event. So let me start by reminding everyone that tonight's event is being recorded and it's going to be available on London Learning Cooperative's YouTube channel, uh, where you'll also find recordings of our other talks. There'll be a Q&A session at the end and you can submit questions uh, using the Q&A button that you, sh you should see on your screens. Um, and there'll be three panelists who are aiming to keep their contributions to about 15 minutes each. And then we'll have about half an hour at the end for questions um, with some obvious flexibility built into that, um, that setup. So before introducing those three speakers, let me just say a few words about the two hosts tonight. Um, London Learning Cooperative is, a, is a, a workers cooperative tuition agency and it's a, really it's a global experiment in radical pedagogy, uh, anti-imperialist pedagogy. Um, so we have tutors around the world in places like Venezuela, Ireland, Palestine and Pakistan. Um, I mean we started out kind of retracing the roots of the British Empire. We started out in places like Pakistan and Palestine because those were obviously ex-British colonies and then we moved to places like Ireland because that's a place where you know, the Irish language uh, suffered a lot following its violent contact with um, British colonialism. Um, and then we've recently branched out into places like Venezuela. So we're trying to move beyond just the British. Obviously, the British do have a history in Latin America, but um, Venezuela more readily associated with the Spanish Empire and then more recently with um, American actions in, uh, or, or I should say US actions in Latin America. Um, so that's where London Learning Cooperative kind of comes from. Um, and we're committing to trying to, bring together this, this international group of people um, to, um, to forge uh, radical educational spaces where we can think about the structures that oppress, oppress us and find ways through dialogue with each other to overcome these oppressive structures and to, um, to make the world basically a better and a more equal place. Um, so we think learning how to speak each other's languages is a good place to start and we're keen to organize future events conducted in other languages. Uh, if you have any ideas about um, future events or anything at all to do with London Learning Cooperative, we're very keen to speak to people who want to collaborate with us. So please don't hesitate to get in touch. And if learning languages in a historical and a political context is something that, um, that interests you, then please visit our website for more information. And, and as I say, don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Um, so in addition to languages, we're now branching out into legal tuition. Um, and it's in that connection that we've teamed up with the Materialist Lawyers Group tonight. Um, they're a group of practicing lawyers based in both Britain and Ireland. Um, and they aim to provide a space for legal practitioners to reflect critically on their practice as lawyers. Um, so MLG links practicing lawyers with uh, thinkers within and beyond academia. And MLG are particularly interested in the idea that, at least in certain instances, the law, the legal system, might do more to reproduce rather than resolve socioeconomic conflict. So highly critical view of law by um, actual practicing lawyers. Uh, so to tonight's event, um, in Palestine, Venezuela and Ireland, people continue to face oppression by reactionary forces that deny them their rights in numerous ways. And though they're different in important respects, these struggles have much to learn from one another. So our panel tonight brings together legal experts and activists to explore challenges to Israeli annexation and apartheid in Palestine. Um, we'll have updates from recent cases in the six counties in the north of Ireland, challenging the legacy of British colonialism. And we'll have analysis of the situation in Venezuela, uh, including the English High Court's recent decision to deny uh, Maduro's Venezuelan government access to its own gold that was, of course, uh, stored by the Bank of England, wasn't it? Um, as well as some stuff about sanctions. So our event, as I say, is aimed at creating a kind of a space for us to think about um, the uses and abuses of law in particular in, in perpetuating colonial and imperial structures, um, as well as how law can operate as a place of resistance and uh, liberation. We've held previous events where we've tried to link together um, Ireland and Palestine. And now this is our attempt to move beyond that, to try something more ambitious, to try to start to create this, this global space where we can 
um, we can explore, explore not only similarities, but also differences between uh, different geographically situated struggles for um, equality, emancipation and uh, freedom. So I'm going to I'm going to introduce um, the three of our speakers um, at the beginning of their talks. I won't I won't introduce all three of them now. I'll just introduce the, the first speaker and then uh, we'll move on to the second and the third. OK, so uh, let me turn to our first speaker, who is um, the formidable Rania Moharab. She's a legal researcher and advocacy officer with the Palestinian human rights organization Al Haq. She holds a master's degree in international human rights and humanitarian law from the European University Viadrina Frankfurt Oder and a BA in political science from Sciences Po in Paris. Rani is going to discuss annexation as a symptom of Israeli apartheid and ways of overcoming Israel's institutionalized oppression and domination over the Palestinian people. Over to you, Rania. Thanks very much, Frank, and uh, good evening, afternoon to everyone watching us. Thanks also to the London Learning Cooperative for organizing this important event, um, which really looks at commonalities between the Irish, Venezuelan and Palestinian struggles against oppression. And I think it's important that we recognize the interconnectedness between all um, anti-colonial struggles around the world. And I'm hoping to at least present the Palestinian situation to you today. Um, over the past few months, what we've seen uh, in Palestine has been a lot of discussions around annexation, uh, plans to illegally annex further um, Palestinian land in the occupied West Bank. And what's important to remember for us today is that annexation in the Palestinian context is not unprecedented. Um, in fact, in 1948, Israel illegally annexed uh, West Jerusalem after it declared that Israel occupied territory. And then again in 1967, Israel occupied and annexed East Jerusalem. And in 1981, Israel annexed the occupied Syrian Golan. And these territories remain illegally annexed under international law. So this means that annexation cannot be understood in isolation from the wider context of settler colonialism and apartheid imposed over the Palestinian people. My presentation today will look at um, and build on joint advocacy that has been carried out by Palestinian and regional civil society organizations um, to overcome Israel's apartheid regime. Uh, I will also draw on some, um, on some materials that I've linked in the chat box, include, including a recent article uh, published in This Week in Palestine titled Annexation as a Symptom of Israeli Apartheid uh, by my colleague Nada Awad and myself. To begin, I think it's important that we highlight annexation as a legacy of settler colonialism, um, a legacy of, of colonial dispossession as well as erasure of the indigenous Palestinian people. We know that between 1920 and 1948, Palestine was under British mandatory rule. The British mandate set the stage for a process of colonization that in fact has never ended in Palestine. Already in 1919, um, the League of Nations had recognized the right of self-determination of peoples under colonial and mandatory rule, with the covenant of the League of Nations specifically having considered that communities formerly belonging to the Turkish Empire, that included, of course, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, as well as Palestine, had, and I quote, reached a stage of development where their existence as independent nations can be provisionally recognized, end of quote. The League of Nations designated Palestine as a Class A mandate and recognized Palestine's provisional independence already at the time. In addition, we know that in 1945, the Charter of the UN permanently outlawed the use of force and acquisition of territory by force. This is the legal basis for the prohibition on annexation, which is binding on all states. Yet on November 29, 1947, the UN General Assembly recommended the partition of Palestine. The partition plan, as we know, it divided the territory of Mandate Palestine, and in doing so, violated sacrosanct principles of international law as it stood at the time by partitioning a self-determination unit in which Palestinian self-determination and independence had already been recognized provisionally. As such, the prohibition on acquisition of territory by force and annexation was already well established in international law by the time of the Nakba or catastrophe of 1948. In addition, the laws and customs of war already prohibited mass expulsion of civilian populations, murder, and wanton destruction of cities, towns, and villages, or devastation not justified by military necessity. 
which were recognized as international crimes and had in fact been enshrined in the 1945 Charter of the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg. Only a few years later, after the Nuremberg trials, between 1947 and 1949, Zionist militias carried out a widespread ethnic cleansing campaign. They killed over 10,000 Palestinians, um, destroyed uh, 531 Palestinian villages and towns, and expelled 85% of the indigenous Palestinian people from their homes, lands, and property. Palestinian society was decimated during the Nakba, and only about 150,000 Palestinians remained within the, within the Green Line following the war. A quarter of them had been internally displaced, and some of them remain mere kilometers from their original homes, to which they are unable to return until this day. Although the crimes committed during the Nakba were already recognized as such at the time, no perpetrators were ever held accountable, nor were Palestinian victims remedied, and this impunity has continued until today. And this is despite the fact that Israel remains under a legal obligation to repatriate and compensate Palestinian refugees and displaced persons. We know in particular that on December 11th, 1948, the UN General Assembly adopted Resolution 194, which recognized the right of return of Palestinian refugees, um, and it recognized that this was already a part of international law or customary law at the time. Resolution 194 has been reaffirmed over a hundred times in UN resolutions since, more than any other in UN history, and this reflects, of course, the strength that the right of return has gained over time. So in addition to understanding the illegality of annexation as a legacy of ongoing settler colonialism, we must also consider it as a symptom of Israeli apartheid in the Palestinian context. In the years that followed the Nakba, Israel put in place a series of laws, policies, and practices that institutionalized Jewish racial supremacy over the indigenous Palestinian people, symptomatic of Israel's creation of an apartheid regime. Through the 1950 Law of Return, the 1952 Law of Citizenship, and the 52 Entry into Israel Law, Israel granted every Jewish person the exclusive right to enter Israel as a Jewish immigrant, to receive preferential treatment, and to obtain citizenship, thereby creating a superior status of Jewish nationality under Israeli law. As a result, Israeli citizenship, which was granted to Palestinians who remained within the Green Line following 1948, has never been the basis for equal rights. In addition, Israel adopted the 1950 Absentee Property Law, which became a key legal instrument for the dispossession of Palestinians. It was used to confiscate the property of Palestinian refugees and displaced persons who were considered absentees, despite being denied their right of return as a matter of state policy. The Absentee Property Law is still used today to displace Palestinians from their homes and property, in particular in Jerusalem. The main tool of Israeli apartheid over the Palestinian people, as highlighted in the 2017 report by the UN Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia, ESQA, has been the strategic fragmentation of the Palestinian people, which annexation of large parts of the West Bank would only serve to entrench. Today, Palestinians are separated into four legal, political, and geographic domains, comprising Palestinians within the Green Line who are subject to Israeli civil law, Palestinians in Jerusalem who are subject to Israeli residency law, a residency which can continuously be revoked to transfer Palestinians from Jerusalem, as well as Palestinians subject to Israeli military law in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, and Palestinian refugees and exiles whose right of return continues to be denied. Through the strategic fragmentation, Israel weakens the ability of the Palestinian people to effectively and collectively seek realization of their rights, and this prevents them from challenging the many facets of Israel's apartheid regime. Fragmentation also obscures the very existence of Israeli apartheid by treating Palestinians in different areas as if they were separate fragments of the Palestinian people. In addition to fragmentation, Israeli apartheid is continuously maintained on the ground, through the creation of a coercive environment that's designed to drive Palestinian transfer from their lands, as well as the denial of family unification for Palestinians from different areas, the revocation of residency rights in Jerusalem, freedom of movement restrictions, including as a result of the annexation wall in the West Bank, collective punishment, including the illegal closure of Gaza for the past 13 years, mass arbitrary detention and torture and other ill treatment, which is sanctioned by Israeli courts, as well as a government-led smear and delegitimization campaign 
targeting human rights defenders and organizations seeking to challenge Israel's apartheid regime. While the Israeli government now seeks to formalize the illegal annexation of large parts of the West Bank, the reality is that Area C of the West Bank, which the Oslo Accords designated a place under full Israeli control and which constitutes about 60% of the West Bank, has been under de facto Israeli annexation for decades as a result of aggressive settlement construction and expansion, the systematic exploitation of Palestinian natural resources, in particular water, which is diverted to Jewish settlements, and discriminatory planning and zoning, which leads to house demolitions and the transfer of Palestinians from their lands. The Israeli occupying authorities have targeted the means of subsistence of the Palestinian people, including in the Jordan Valley, where many Palestinians belong to rural and herding communities. This process will, of course, only be accelerated with formal de jure annexation of the occupied territory. It's important to recall here, finally, that in this regard, Israel dominates the use of land and other natural resources, as well as planning and physical development for Palestinians on both sides of the Green Line, with the aim of limiting the expansion of Palestinian cities, villages, and towns while advancing Jewish settlement. In doing so, Israel has given quasi-governmental status to Zionist parastatal institutions, such as the World Zionist Organization, the Jewish Agency, and the Jewish National Fund, which are chartered to carry out material discrimination against non-Jewish persons. Israel formally defers to these institutions in all matters of legislation and policy, affecting development, commerce, agriculture, access to and control over land and resources, urban planning, and other civil matters. In 98, the UN Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights recognized that, and I quote, the large-scale systematic confiscation of Palestinian land and property by the state and the transfer of that property to these agencies constitute an institutionalized form of discrimination because these agencies, by definition, would deny the use of these properties to non-Jews, end of quote. As such, annexation really has to be addressed within the context of Israeli apartheid, which is the overarching framework within which widespread and systematic human rights violations are committed against the Palestinian people. Recognition of Israel's commission of the crime of apartheid by states and civil society is an important first step in addressing the root causes of Palestinian oppression. International law enshrines apartheid as a crime against humanity in Article 7.1j of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, which defines the crime of apartheid as inhumane acts committed in the context of an institutionalized regime of systematic oppression and domination by one racial group over any other racial group or groups and committed with the intention of maintaining that regime. Over the past few years, there has, there has been cumulative recognition of Israeli apartheid by civil society, UN bodies, experts, and member states, including South Africa and Namibia. In 2017, ESCOR recognized Israel's establishment of apartheid over the Palestinian people as a whole. And in December 2019, the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination highlighted for the first time Israeli policies and practices of racial segregation and apartheid as disproportionately impacting Palestinians on both sides of the Green Line. And this followed, of course, Israel's adoption in 2018 of the Jewish nation state basic law, which determined Jewish settlement as a national value and gave constitutional force to racial segregation within the Green Line and the expansion of illegal Israeli settlements in the occupied Palestinian territory. In June 2020, 114 Palestinian regional and international civil society groups called on states to recognize Israeli apartheid over the Palestinian people, delivering a joint statement at the UN Human Rights Council in which they urged that the UN um, and member states reconstitute the UN Special Committee Against Apartheid and the UN Center Against Apartheid as critical first steps towards over overcoming Israel's regime. Also in June 2020, 47 UN special procedures warned that the morning after annexation would be the crystallization of an already unjust reality, two peoples living in the same space ruled by the same state but with profoundly unequal rights. This is a vision of a 21st century apartheid. End of quote. Only by adopting effective measures, including economic sanctions and upholding international justice and accountability for crimes committed against Palestinians, including at the International Criminal Court, can states start to effectively address annexation as a symptom of Israeli apartheid. 
civil society played an important role in dismantling apartheid in South Africa. Through increased recognition of Israeli apartheid and mobilization, the same is possible in Palestine. If past experience is anything to go by, then human rights violations against Palestinians will continue unabated so long as the root causes are not addressed. These root causes are Israeli settler colonialism and apartheid. With or without annexation, it's time to recognize this reality. Thank you. Thanks very much, um, Rania, um, for your fascinating and very insightful uh, contribution. And turning now then to our next speaker, who is Daniel Holder. He's Deputy Director of the Belfast-based human rights NGO, the Committee on the Administration of Justice. He has a master's degree in human rights law, and he's going to speak on Northern Irish legal developments regarding the Irish peace process in particular, relating to the Irish language, Brexit, and the legacy of the conflict in the six counties. Over to you, Daniel. Thanks very much, and thanks for the invitation. Look, I mean, we're obviously not in the same situation as Palestine and Venezuela face at the moment, but we are dealing with a with a huge amount of issues as not just a society emerging um, from conflict, but as a divided society, as a society with a, a poisoned colonial legacy. Um, and a lot of our issues are traced back to the past, and that's not just necessarily the past of the armed conflict, but the past of the form of government that was imposed from the time of partition um, a century ago um, into the new entry uh, an entity of Northern Ireland, an, an autonomous government for right up from 1921 up to Bloody Sunday in 1972 that really concentrated power and reflected the interests of one side of the community. And yes, you could see that within the administration of the, who made up the administration of the state in terms of one side of the community. And it wasn't just policing, it was, it was broader than that. But you can also see it in the assertion of a, a highly monocultural model of the state and its ethos, not just in, the, in, in terms of practical equal rights in relation to employment, housing, and things like that, that, that are sometimes well known, but also in terms of uh, its, its monocultural ethos um, and its discriminatory approach to, to different groups. Now, um, just at the beginning of the conflict, reminded um, in, the, in the second city of Derry, some of the signs that were put up by the British Army to try and disperse civil rights and other protesters were actually bilingual. They were in English and Arabic. And the reason for that was is because the British Army had previously used the same banners in Palestine and Oman and probably a number of other places. But that, in terms of the official state, is probably one of the few examples of bilingualism <laughs> that we can draw from that period because one of the, the strong elements of the old uh, Stormont uh, administration uh, is evidenced in the approach to the Irish language and the attempts to continue the monolingual, i.e. English-only approach that the colonial administration had previously had. In fact, the 1921 government managed within a, a generation to eliminate the last native speakers of Irish, as well as removing Irish from, from public space and public administration, so you wouldn't find it, for example, on road signs and street signs, even though a lot of the place names are in fact just English transliterations of the original in Irish. And then one of the issues over that is we're kind of stuck with that. If, if you have, a, we now have power sharing post the Good Friday Agreement in 1998, but if you have a situation whereby there are multiple vetoes on all signs, you sort of stuck with the status quo in a sense it's very difficult to change uh, things and uh, unless there is specific provision within the, the peace settlement and we found some of that I mean and before the Good Friday Agreement in 1998 one of the things the British government agreed to do was to remove the absolute ban on Irish and street signs which is within the competence of local councils but it left local councils with very significant discretion as to whether to provide signs or not and Whilst we found it possible to take judicial reviews in legal cases with other partners, like last year we did, against a, a, a British unionist dominated council that had introduced an absolute ban on Irish language signage, it was possible to go to court and have a de jure ban like that removed. But it's much more difficult when effectively it's a de facto ban where there is the appearance of a process, but it's a process that's designed to fail. 
and as it sets the threshold far too high, comes people who don't re return phones as saying no uh, to signage when that's not necessarily the case. Um, so that creates a problem. Another problem was that although within the Good Friday Agreement there's quite significant commitments, and the Good Friday Agreement is a treaty, it's a treaty between the British Irish governments, it's lodged with the UN, is legally binding in international law, as indeed are a number of the treaties that flowed for it that are relevant to the Irish language, like the Council of Europe, European Convention for Regional Minority Languages, for which Irish was registered for. The problem with that is they're not incorporated into domestic law. And you have the, the dualist system within the UK, including Northern Ireland, which means what tends to happen is that where there's political hostility, the duties under those particular treaties just get ignored and there's very little you can do about them um, within the domestic courts. We were also supposed to, under the Good Friday Agreement, have a Bill of Rights that would supplement one of the great achievements of the Good Friday Agreement, which was the incorporation of the European Convention of Human Rights into Northern Ireland law, and I'll return to that in a, in a, in a minute. We're supposed to have a Bill of Rights that would have legislated, for example, for quality of treatment, i.e. equal rights between British and Irish citizens within uh, Northern Ireland, but that also wasn't taken forward. And when you actually get to the collapse of the Good Friday Agreement institutions early on and their re-establishment by a fresh treaty in 2006, the um, St Andrews Agreement, you have more provisions built in. So outside of the language, we had things like an anti-poverty strategy based on objective need that had to be adopted to try and eradicate the, the sort of poison legacy of, of poverty and discrimination, had an Irish language strategy, and also a commitment to Irish language legislation, reflecting on the legislation in Wales that would have given a level of enforceability to the commitments to the Irish language. But at that point, we had a political situation where the largest British Unionist Party in Northern Ireland was by then the, the DUP, Democratic Unionist Party that had opposed the Good Friday Agreement, opposes most rights and equality issues in general. And ultimately, none of those three commitments, either anti-poverty, Irish language strategy, or the Irish Language Act were, were implemented. And the DUP opposed um, the concept of poverty being tackled on the basis of objective need, because that essentially meant more anti-poverty measures would benefit Irish Catholics because of much higher levels of, of, of poverty. 2005, we were successful in the judicial review over not adopting that strategy. Our colleagues, Conrad McGaleger and the Irish language movement took a similar judicial review and was successful that the government had acted unlawfully, in not adopting either the anti-poverty and Irish language strategy respectively. But it didn't mean we got one straight away, it threw it back into the political process. And the same was really the case with the Irish Language Act, and it wasn't just a, a corruption scandal in 2007, it was the whole issue of sectarianism and decision-making, of contempt for Irish language, uh, and other issues that really collapsed the institutions for three years until they were re-established in January of this year with a fresh commitment to Irish language legislation. And obviously we're keeping now a sort of strong watching brief on that as to as to whether that commitment is, is actually realized. So that's one particular element, the Irish language and, and some of the litigation around it. There are other elements of the peace settlement. I mentioned the premises of equality of treatment for British and Irish citizens. Also relevant was the uh, police reform, dismantlement of border infrastructure that was within the peace agreements, including the reopening of all the roads along the border. There's over 200 which is actually more roads and crossings than there are on the entire eastern frontier of the European Union. Um, and we did benefit from a relatively successful institutional reform of the criminal justice and policing system. Now, we've had a bit of backtracking on policing recently, particularly over the way the Black Lives Matter protests were uh, handled um, by the police here. And um, that's maybe a new problem, but the uh, one of the areas of policing that hadn't advanced was policing the past and the issue of having a very significant legacy of human rights violations during the most recent period of armed conflict that had never been subject to proper investigation. Um, to put it short, I mean, the rule of law was never applied to the security forces during the conflict. Um, I, I should have scribbled down more statistics, but 
Um, uh, some of them you can remember. So the, in the first few years of the conflict, which is the ones currently under legacy investigations, around 200 people were shot dead by the security forces. Um, the statistics which I remember in terms of the number of convictions of soldiers, incidentally 63% of people who were shot dead were undisputedly unarmed at the time they were shot dead. Only I think about 14% were in possession of a weapon and that didn't necessarily mean they were posing a threat at that time. Figures for convictions, there were zero convictions at that point of members of the security forces. There were zero prosecutions and there were zero police investigations, sometimes an internal review within the military. Essentially, the rule of law wasn't applied to the security forces. At the time of the Good Friday Agreement, there was an attempt essentially to embed that in that there was no transitional justice mechanism, no mechanism for dealing with the past within the agreement. It was really about drawing the line. Ourselves and others took cases to Strasbourg over that, um, which developed a lot of the Article 2 jurisprudence about the procedural duties under Article 2, the right to life, for effective, impartial, um, and independent investigations into um, suspicious deaths. Um, that coupled ultimately with the reforms to the security forces has led to a situation only now in the last few years where you've had the first prosecutions. Um, a handful of soldiers have been prosecuted in relation to killings um, in that early part of the conflict. And there has been a huge backlash from elements of the sort of British military, political and, uh, and media establishment that has now led to a situation not only in, in March this year, in the middle of the pandemic, as it was um, taking force that the UK abandoned the commitment for a fresh set of institutions to deal with the legacy of the conflict, commitment that it had made in an international agreement with the Irish government, Stormont House it was called in 2015, um, and the Northern Ireland political parties, and is now seeking to legislate for an amnesty for all of its uh, overseas operations and some as yet unknown similar provisions in relation to the Northern Ireland conflict. So again, we're back to a situation where the state is seeking to disapply the rule of law of the security forces. We still have, as things stand, the ECHR incorporated into Northern Ireland law as part of the Good Friday Agreement. And whether we see, as was threatened in the Conservative Manifesto, whether we see another attempt to unravel that and introduce some sort of limitation as to its application, try and prevent the rule of law being applied to the security forces, we will, uh, we await to see. So, and there will be no doubt lots of litigation on that. A um, couple of other examples, I mean, ourselves and a number of other NGOs are currently involved in a case that's in the Court of Appeal in London called the Third Direction, which relates to MI5, the UK's internal security services, guidelines on the use of informants, um, not generally informants, but in terms of what crimes um, informants are allowed to commit and essentially de facto uh, get away with. Um, this has been something that's concerned us for a long time. One of the patterns, as well as the direct use of force, one of the patterns of human rights violations during the Northern Ireland conflict was paramilitary collusion, whereby various levels of collusion with uh, pro-state paramilitary groups um, in serious human rights violations, and particularly um, the use of informants, whereby informant involvement in, in killings was either tolerated or facilitated and directed has been a form of serious concern. So that's one case um, that we took originally to the UK Secretive Investigatory Powers Tribunal. Now we lost, but only just, it was a 3-2 split judgment as to, what, uh, as to the lawfulness of uh, those guidelines. And it's now um, within the Court of Appeal uh, uh, um, for a further hearing. Um, I wanted to flag up one particular incident within the Northern Ireland conflict that's led to a significant amount of litigation, and I'm sure there's other things we can pick up from later on, but the 1994 Lockan Island massacre, which was a massacre by loyalist paramilitaries in a, in a Northern Ireland pub during a, an Irish football match, um, has been one that's been long contested as involving levels of collusion. Now, we have an independent police ombudsman, um, Unfortunately, the first report the Ombudsman produced into that massacre seemed to very much underplay the family's uh, well-held suspicions of paramilitary collusion. And there was a judicial review against that that led to the report ultimately being quashed. Um, ultimately, that Ombudsman had to resign for 
um, failing to deal effectively with the, uh, failing to uh, do his job essentially in terms of investigating past human rights uh, violations. There was then relatively recently a second police ombudsman report into the Lockan Island massacre that revealed a number of things, including um, British military intelligence involvement in an arms shipment from apartheid South Africa, um, which had armed loyalist paramilitaries for weapons that were involved in and dozens of killings, including the Lock and Island massacre. Now, that, along with other evidence of collusion being a significant feature in the Lock and Island massacre, was um, within the Ombudsman's public published report, but that report had been subject to national security redactions by the Ombudsman. And ultimately, what happened was an unredacted version of that report was leaked to two journalists, uh, Trevor Burney and Barry McCaffrey, who made a documentary about it. And what that revealed, among other things, was that an informant had been part of the, the murder cell. Um, and also it named the, the chief suspect who it appeared had not been subject to, to proper police inquiry. So after those revelations, you'd inspect, you, you would expect the reaction of the police to be very swift and quick. And it was arrests. Um, followed very quickly of the two journalists um, whose homes and offices and media companies were raided um, in an operation involving around 100 officers. So a huge over-the-top operation. Um, the, the two journalists were bizarrely accused, accused who'd received the leaked document, were bizarrely accused of having stolen it. Um, it's really sent a shudder down the spine of the, the journalistic and human rights community about policing still being used in this political manner when we had uh, such a level of reform that we had confidence in as having, be, uh, having taken us in the right direction. Now, positively, the other bit of the reform system, which is the justice system, did work in this case, and the courts on, on the back of a judicial review did quash the search warrants and um, mandated the returns of that the return of the material, the journalists were, were released and have essentially uh, won, but there's huge amounts of litigation still around that particular case, including a challenge which has now been dismissed from retired police officers just on a technicality that the ombudsman shouldn't be allowed to make findings in the, in the report. So the battle for the past goes on and a lot of it is in the courtrooms because it is the one bit of the system that, that has been reformed to, to work. So finally, um, I had a timer on here, but um, I've gone on for long enough that it's actually gone off and I can't see it, so I've, I've lost track of time. But finally, the issue of Brexit I was asked to address because that is something that lands in all of this context. And Brexit was always something that was going to have significant implications on the Irish peace process and the jurisdiction here. Not, not in part because if you look at whatever, regardless of issues around the EU, Brexit essentially was a mobilization of the hard rate of British nationalism and, and follows trends across Europe and, uh, and beyond in that sense. And that was always going to have significant implications for here, where we already had problems of paramilitary involvement and racist violence and worsening racial discrimination against migrants and other ethnic minorities. So we found, we found ourselves in that situation. We found ourselves with exactly the same alignment of forces that had supported the Good Friday Agreement, and including the Ulster Unionist Party, but also the Irish Nationalist Parties and Centrist Parties, opposed Brexit. And the DUP, who'd opposed the Good Friday Agreement, supported Brexit. Then something quite significant happened. And I mean, the DUP, from their perspective, pushed for a very hard Brexit. And in some senses, they've always been empty Good Friday Agreement. And for them, it was a real opportunity, uh, really, to roll back elements of the, of the peace agreement. If you think of things that I mentioned earlier on around border infrastructure being dismantled, partly a product of the peace settlement, dismantlement of military installations, partly a product of duly EU membership that removed customs controls, of course, all of that could be reversed by a particularly hard Brexit, and it's only the, the Irish government through the EU countering that that's led to a situation where there won't be a hardened border with an island. But the DUP found itself in a very powerful position because the UK Prime Minister at the time, Theresa May, called that disastrous general election, ended up with a minority government reliant on DUP support. So you ended up in a situation whereby the push for the DUP for a particular form of hard Brexit against the Good Friday Agreement 
gained quite a lot of political prominence and traction. And the UK government itself for many years couldn't agree on its position as to what type of EU withdrawal it was going to pursue. In fact, that must have been very frustrating for the EU um, in the sense of the UK government was more negotiating with itself for years rather than with the EU. In fact, there was a, a joke going around that the, um, the time that perhaps the EU should just recognise someone else as the British Prime Minister arbitrarily and negotiate with them even though they weren't in power because if it was okay for the UK to do that with Venezuela, um, then why not um, in that context for, for to reflect on the EU. But big problems for Brexit are that it leaves us with a very strange situation and that everyone in Northern Ireland is, is or is entitled to be an Irish citizen and EU citizen still. So you have a situation where you have a group of EU citizens that are becoming a diaspora and can't exercise most of their EU rights because they're normally based on residency within a member state. Um, so that um, creates a problem. But also we're, we're talking about a peace process, half successful, but it was aimed at eliminating different boundaries between groups of people, above all British and Irish citizens. And what actually happens with Brexit is it hardens the boundaries between British and Irish citizens because you end up with British and Irish citizens having completely different sets of rights and entitlements to a large extent. So if we'd had our Bill of Rights in place under the Good Friday Agreement, then um, that would not have been possible. Brexit for us would not have been possible because of the equality of treatment um, provisions, at least at, at, at anything other than its softest form. We were party to a case actually that went up to the UK Supreme Court, Agnew and others, um, that argued that the arrangements flowing from the Good Friday Agreement, that the UK constitutional arrangements, the UK government was uh, acting incompatibly with them through pursuing Brexit without the, for example, the consent of the, the Parliament, the Assembly in, in Northern Ireland. We ended up with a ruling from the Supreme Court that whilst that may, may well be unconstitutional, um, as it breached constitutional conventions, it wasn't unlawful under, under UK law, given the, the system of an un written constitution, that's quite difficult to explain internationally how something can be unconstitutionally, but not domestically unlawful. That is the situation we found ourselves in. So look, as I said at the beginning, we're not in the same situation at the moment as, as Venezuela and, and Palestine. There's a very poisoned legacy and there's plenty to be keeping human rights activists worried and busy at present. Thank you, Cormier. Thanks very much, Daniel. Um, just for those of you who've missed my comment in the chat, um, those wanting to tweet about tonight's event can use the hashtag uh, Palestine Ireland. Uh, and that's not out of any um, desire to throw shade at our Venezuelan comrades. It's just that you can fit only so many uh, letters into a hashtag. And also that's the hashtag that we used for a previous event of ours that was specifically about Palestine and Ireland. Um, and you'll see that some people um, already on Twitter talking about uh, tonight's event, so we invite you to um, to join them if you have any commentary um, that you'd like to share publicly. Um, so thank you very much, Daniel, um, for your incredibly insightful contribution to this um, this this conversation, this space that we're trying to create tonight. Um, let's turn now to Dan Kovalik, who graduated from Columbia University School of Law in 1993, um, after which he served as in-house legal counsel to the United Steelworkers Union until 2019. He has taught international human rights at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law since 2012. He's the author of several books, including The Plot to Overthrow Venezuela and his most recent book, No More War, How the West Violates International Law by Using Humanitarian Intervention to Advance Economic and Strategic Interests. Uh, he'll be speaking about the current sanctions regimes uh, against countries like Venezuela, Iran, Cuba, and Nicaragua, and how these sanctions violate uh, numerous international law norms. Over to you, Dan. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be with you today uh, to talk about these important issues. First, I want to start, before I get into the sanctions, I wanted to mention a couple U.S. legal developments that I think are relevant to our discussion. First of all, obviously, the United States is a settler, settler colonial nation of its own. Um, very interestingly, a few weeks ago, the Supreme Court of the United States, a pretty conservative court, ruled that half of Oklahoma, 
including most of Tulsa, the capital of Oklahoma, is uh, indigenous land. It is uh, the land uh, of the Creek Nation and that they have sovereignty over half of Oklahoma. And again, most of the state capital, Tulsa, of course, Eric Clapton sang about uh, living on Tulsa time. Well, Tulsa time is now Creek time. Uh, this is a major breakthrough, I think, for uh, indigenous people, not only in the United States, but throughout the world. We'll see how this develops, but I wanted to keep people in uh, on that. Um, the other case I wanted to bring to your attention, because I think ultimately, I'm going to cut to the chase, ultimately I think the sanctions regimes that the U.S. has against, there's like 35 countries right now, I think the best way ultimately to challenge those will be in U.S. courts. Uh, if you're not familiar, over a hundred years ago, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled in a case called uh, the Paquette Havana, a case growing out of the Spanish-American uh, War of 1898. It ruled that international law is our law. And uh, it held that in a case where it found that um, uh, U.S. citizens had wrongly, had violated uh, customary international law by seizing civilian uh, uh, fishermen craft that were uh, sailing under the uh, Spanish flag. Uh, this was a very early case of, that found a customary international humanitarian law. But the point is, there that the courts in the U.S. may be a venue to bring international law cases because as we know the cases brought before the international bodies the U.S. has tended to, to ignore. Um, I just want to mention one of the probably the most famous of those cases which is still relevant to this day. Uh, most of you probably know about it that's the Nicaragua versus United States case decided in 1986, which had many, uh, that was the case before the International Court of Justice. And they have, an, uh, it's a case that I often go back to. They had a lot of great rulings in that case, including by the way, that there's no such thing as humanitarian intervention under international law. They explicitly said that. Uh, so it's a case that's worth going back to. Of course, the U.S. never abided by that decision. Um, though in 2017, Nicaragua uh, announced that it was going to try to reopen that case to get the monies it is owed uh, under that case, because uh, growing out of, of course, the U.S.'s support of the Contras in Nicaragua and the U.S.'s mining of the Nicaraguan harbors. So I wanted to throw that out. Uh, Nicaragua, by the way, uh, which doesn't get a lot of attention, uh, sadly, I think, is under a very severe uh, sanctions regime by the United States called the NICA Act, which was passed in 2019, which, uh, like those against uh, Venezuela and Iran and Cuba as well, um, aim uh, specifically at trying to cut Nicaragua off from all international financing, including from the World Bank and International Monetary Fund. And these are bodies uh, that Nicaragua had successfully, since the Sandinistas were reelected in 2007, Nicaragua has used monies from those types of institutions for poverty reduction, for important social programs, and now they're being cut off from that. You might have seen um, that Venezuela is under a similar sanctions regime. Venezuela had, for example, uh, gone to the International uh, Monetary Fund for a $5 billion loan to help in fighting the pandemic. And the U.S. Uh, blocked that loan. Iran is also seeking a loan in that amount from the IMF. We'll see what happens, but my guess is they won't get it. 
um, because the U.S. Um, is blocking that sort of assistance to countries uh, that it is at odds with. Um, to be, be clear, those types of sanctions regimes, uh, which would also include the sanctions regime against Syria, which was recently heightened by the Caesar Act, um, these are all quite clearly illegal sanctions regimes. And why? First of all, I would argue, and other people like Dr. Alfred Desaius, a former UN expert, also argues that, first of all, only the Security Council of the United Nations has the authority to impose sanctions on another country uh, for um, being a threat to international peace and security. Individual countries, I would argue, do not have the right to do that. Even if they did, the, a number of UN bodies have been very clear, including the Human Rights Council recently, and including the General Assembly of the UN recently, have been very clear that these extraterritorial sanctions, and I'll explain what that means, are clearly unlawful under international law. And so what does it mean to have extraterritorial sanctions? It's one thing, for example, for the U.S. to say, okay, U.S. citizens like you, Dan Kavalik, can't do business with certain people in Venezuela, okay? As a U.S. citizen, the U.S. government has some authority over me to say, don't do business with these countries, right? The problem, or one of the problems with U.S. sanctions regimes is that they are extraterritorial in, in that what they're doing is saying, hey, you in Sweden, you can't sell respirators, ventilators to Cuba, which recently happened, right? The U.S. blocked the sale of ventilators uh, to Cuba. Um, and so the U.S., what it's saying, it's also uh, effectively blocked Mexico under its sanctions regime from sending food to Venezuela. These are extraterritorial sanctions. The U.S. has no authority over Mexico or over Switzerland, right? Uh, it can't tell these other countries who they can and cannot trade with. That is very clear. Again, the General Assembly of the UN just reaffirmed this idea, the Human Rights Council. So these are obviously unlawful um, sanctions. Now, Venezuela, for its part right now, uh, it has a couple uh, pieces of litigation going, including they are, have started a case before the International Criminal Court against the US to try to challenge the US sanctions regime against Venezuela. I should know, and what they're claiming is that it's a crime against humanity, it's killing civilians, um, and that the ICC has authority to uh, prosecute that. Uh, I wanna call your attention if you don't are not aware of it, there was a very good uh, report done by the Center for Economic Policy Research, CEPR, out of Washington, D.C. They uh, published their report in 2019, and they estimated that U.S. sanctions between 2017 and 2018, so in only a one-year period, killed 40,000 Venezuelans. 40,000 in one year. And they determined this based on people, the number of people in Venezuela who need insulin, who need HIV medication, who need chemotherapy medication, who need dialysis equipment, all things being denied by US sanctions. And they estimated pretty conservatively that 40,000 people died in a one year period. Uh, soon thereafter, uh, Alfred Desaius, the same UN expert who's been talking and writing to anyone who'd listen to him about what's happening in Venezuela, estimated that by the time he expressed his opinion, at least 100,000 Venezuelans had died due to U.S. sanctions. And so the idea that 
these uh, are war crimes and crimes against humanity. These are very real allegations that Venezuela has against the United States. Iran also uh, would have similar arguments as well as Syria, Cuba, Nicaragua, to name a few countries under similar sanctions regimes. Now, I want to mention that Iran successfully brought an international, a case before the International Court of Justice last year. They won a case against the U.S. in which the International Court of Justice invalidated certain sanctions uh, by the U.S. against Iran, which was a big decision. Uh, now, of course, the U.S. in response said, well, we're not going to follow that decision. And in fact, we no longer recognize the general jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. Uh, the U.S., as we know, has gone completely rogue, right? It has sanctioned the International Criminal Court. Uh, it is backed out of the Human Rights Council. You know, so the ability to go after the U.S. under these international legal institutions has become very difficult because the U.S. is very close to saying it no longer recognizes international law, which is why I mentioned the idea of actually going to U.S. courts for some sort of remedy in this regard. Um, Venezuela also uh, brought a case in uh, Great Britain to try to attempt to retrieve gold, at least a billion dollars in gold reserves that it has um, deposited in the Bank of England. I imagine getting to it is something like, you know, Gringotts or something in uh, Harry Potter. But nonetheless, um, the court ruled that uh, that because Great Britain recognizes uh, uh, Juan Guaido as the interim president of, of Venezuela, not Nicolas Maduro, that the current government of Venezuela does not have a right to that gold. And they held that uh, it, Juan Guaido uh, does. Now, Venezuela is appealing that decision. And it, it, the, the court in, in England has ruled that Venezuela can appeal some of that decision. And what they can appeal is the part of the decision that says Juan Guaido has a right to that goal. What they can't do is say that Nic the Nicolas Maduro government does have a right to that goal. Uh, which at least on its face seems that Venezuela doesn't have much of an appeal. However, I think what a victory would do that invalidated Guaido's right to the gold would at least by Venezuela time allow the gold to st sit there until maybe something's worked out, until a new government comes in in Venezuela or whatever. So really, it best it bides Venezuela time to retrieve that gold. Meanwhile, something that isn't discussed a lot is that the U.S. has really Obviously, what's being done with the gold uh, by the Bank of England is nothing but, you know, neo-imperial plunder, right? It's just nothing but a, 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 a stick-up, you know. Uh, the U.S. has even done Venezuela even worse by essentially seizing Venezuela's single greatest source of revenue, and that is Venezuela's U.S. oil operations known as Sitka, they handed that company over to a board of Juan Guaido uh, flunkies, for lack of a better word, and all of the billions of dollars in revenue of Sitka are no longer go to Venezuela. Again, an incredible um, act of, of imperial thievery. And so, the ability of, of Venezuela and these other countries to fight these sorts of things is critical. Uh, again, Venezuela is fighting on numerous fronts um, and it may make sense, again, at some point to try to bring a case uh, in US courts to challenge uh, these sanctions.
Uh, I just want to mention one other law. I've probably gone a little over time, but I, again, I, I feel like there's probably a lot of practitioners on here. And so I want to throw things at you that may be helpful in your practices, given that the U.S. is the big kahuna here in terms of sanctioning countries and whatnot. If you're not aware of it, there's an interesting law. One of the oldest laws on the books of the United States dates back to 1789 called the Alien Tort Claims Act. And it allows, what it simply says, it's one sentence long, and it says aliens, it says uh, the courts of the United States have jurisdiction uh, over cases brought by aliens in tort for violations of the law of nations. And what uh, progressive left-wing lawyers have done over time is to use that law to sue, uh, for example, uh, Salvadoran military leaders who come to the U.S. to retire for uh, atrocities they committed in El Salvador. Um, they brought a case against a Guatemalan uh, military leader. They served him at his Harvard commencement for crimes committed in Guatemala. But then those were expanded to bring cases against companies you, uh, um, uh, uh, that have alleged to have committed abuses in other countries like Colombia, South America, for example. I was involved in some of those cases. So again, the Alien Tort Claims Act which has been cut back a bit by the Supreme Court in recent years, may be another avenue for human rights cases in the United States. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thanks so much, Dan. Really, really fascinating insight there. Um, into, and a really broad sweep, if I may say, um, of um, yeah, the US and its use of sanctions regimes as well as, of course, this uh, this case that we in London are all preoccupied with at the moment, this uh, absurd High Court case uh, where um, a judge of the English High Court sees fit to um, to pronounce on who can, who can claim um, the Venezuelan government's gold. We're going to open things up to questions now um, from attendees. Uh, there's two ways for you to ask a question. The first is to use the raise hand um, button. And, um, and if you do that, then we can turn on your mic and you can ask the question that way. Um, or alternatively, if you have a question, uh, you can type it out using the Q&A function at the bottom. Um, and, and then I can read out the question um, to the panelists. And of course, you can ask a question to an individual panelist or to a general question to all three of the panelists. Um, so um, I'm not sure if I can see if anyone's raised their hands, but I think we have a we have a man behind the curtain called Dougald. Um, so props to him for making all of the uh, the seamless magic of the event happen. I don't know if Dougald, if you can see if anyone's raised their hand. I can't see any hands um, at the moment. Okay. Don't be shy. Um, I wonder if just whilst we're um, waiting, maybe I can kick things off just by um, asking you, Rania. I mean, obviously, Rania, you'll have heard what uh, Daniel Holder was saying about the situation in the six counties. Um, and I'm getting fairly familiar now with doing these kind of events where we bring together Palestinian and Irish um, kind of um, activists and lawyers. Now, it seems to me that all of the Irish comrades who come onto a call like this will tend to kick off by saying, obviously, the situation in Ireland today um, is not the same as the situation in Palestine today. Um, and yet it's almost as though Ireland is kind of coming out the other end of a colonial conflict. Um, and as you put it, Daniel, there's this kind of battle for the past. And you said that battle for the past is taking place primarily in the courts. Um, so do you think there's anything to be learned in Palestine, which is in a much uh, shot, it's almost at the other end of the colonial conflict, isn't it? The, the colonial situation is worsening and deepening. The violence is almost increasing in Palestine. Do you nevertheless think there's any useful linkages or perhaps you think it's more useful to explore uh, differences with the situation in the six counties compared to that in, uh, in Palestine? 
Well, I mean, I think as a starting point, um, there were many similarities from what I heard in Dan's presentation, whether it's on questions of impunity, the fact that there haven't been any prosecutions, or at least uh, at the beginning, there were no prosecutions coming out of the conflict. And similar to us, I mean, these are the, this is the same context that we're facing, one where there is institutionalized impunity and violations continue because in fact, they're not being remedied and uh, they're not even being prosecuted in courts. So I do think that there are a lot of similarities from what I heard and um, obviously we've had many discussions in the past as well, um, linking Ireland to Palestine. I think maybe going back to your question, um, there certainly is a lot to be learned for us in Palestine from many different struggles against colonialism around the world. And that's something that we're trying to do to create also linkages between the context in Palestine and, um, and other situations worldwide, whether it's impacting indigenous peoples, so it was interesting to hear the developments in the US in that regard. Um, or in general uh, related to struggles for emancipation and self-determination. Uh, I think just as a, as a general comment, that's certainly for us important to, um, to learn from other contexts and we are trying to do so. Um, I do think that there are more similarities than differences at the end of the day. And uh, I'd be happy to hear from my other co-panelists on this point as well. Yeah, Daniel, I don't know if you have anything to add to that kind of um, spur to discussion. Yeah, I know. I, I think certainly that there are so many similarities uh, across a whole sort of range of things, even some of the stuff I was picking up with on the on the, on the cultural um, equality of rights and things like that, uh, and, and the manner in which states uh, get out of that or don't play the um, I don't apply the rules to themselves, I, I, I think, and particularly powerful states, which goes into the, the, the situation that Venezuela and others have, uh, have been subjected to, and that, that sort of arrogance of, um, in the Venezuelan situation, of major powers, including the, including the UK, recognizing someone as Venezuela's president who didn't even stand in the presidential election, and whose, whose only path to power is through illegal violence, whether it's through a foreign invasion or whether it's through a coup d'etat. There's no other way of someone who isn't in power, who isn't running the country, getting into power in that context. Um, and it's quite frightening hypocrisy in terms of the way state violence can, can, can be normalized and used in that context, yet there won't be any sanctions against Juan Guerrero. There, they, <laughs> there won't be any sanctions um, against his, I think flunkies was the word, was, was used for, for abuses of, uh, of power. They'll be put very selectively. I think as well, the forms of oppression that are, that are used as well. I mean, we've both mentioned the high levels of um, impunity uh, and cover up of um, present and past violations. As, as I said earlier on, there are virtually no um, uh, prosecutions at the early part of the conflict, just to fill in the gap from that. There was virtually none after that in the latter part of the, the conflict either. There were four members of the British Army, a regular British Army ultimately, who went to prison for murder for, for later killings. Um, none of them served at more than a very, very minimal term, I think possibly up to a, a year in prison before being released and, and reinstated um, back in the military. But I think also where there's huge parallels that sometimes aren't explored, and I'd meant and I'd mentioned the the MI5 case in particular, is the use of covert military methodologies and uh, 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 as well. And in our context in particular, the, the form of human rights violations that was done through, through informant infiltration and, and paramilitary groups. I mean, the parallels with Colombia and various other parts of, uh, of Latin America of state deniability, human rights violations through using proxies um, as something very much um that would resonate um with our particular context i'm sure i don't know much about places um in, in detail but uh, some of the things that happened in iraq and afghanistan with the tactics the uk military used it would not surprise me if it was very similar very interesting um and dan just on the subject then of weaving together um the um the three different contexts that we're trying to explore today i don't know if you have any views on um the way that the kind of, I mean, I suppose in particular, what's interesting to me um, is the fact that as, as Rani in particular will be aware, there's obviously this live campaign by Palestinian civil society around boycott, divestment and sanctions. And it's the S in BDS that I think is particularly interesting. 
do you think there's a kind of tension within the US's position where on the one hand it's willing to impose these you know incredibly crippling sanctions regimes as you said you know 40,000 Venezuelans dead as a consequence of these uh, these sanctions and yet when it comes to Israel um, the US government seems to insist that any kind of talk of sanctions is absolutely beyond the pale. I don't know if you have any view on uh, that specifically but more generally if there's linkages between the content of your talk and the context we're trying to identify in the six counties of, uh, of Ireland and, uh, and Palestine. Well, I mean, answering your first question, obviously the U.S. Uh, is famously hypocritical about human rights. I mean, it, it, it uses it uh, as a sword instead of a shield, right? It uses human rights not to protect people. It uses it to go after its ostensible enemies, right? And, uh, you know, as people like Noam Chomsky has pointed out for years, you know, um, human rights concerns only matter if it's in a country that the U.S. doesn't like, right? But if it's one of the U.S.'s client states violating human rights, then that's not a problem. And so we saw, uh, you know, how many times the U.S. has vetoed uh, General Assembly resolutions, um, you know, calling for um, uh, defense of the Palestinian people, how many times they vetoed General Assembly resolutions against apartheid in South Africa, which a lot of people uh, forget. Um, you know, and right now we just see the U.S. doubling down on its support of Israel. It, of course, uh, the Trump administration uh, recognized uh, Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Um, the U.S. has ended all support to the U.N. High Commission for Refugees, which has been a lifeline for people in Gaza in particular. Um, and the U.S. is going along with this plan annexation in the West Bank. All these things are, are hugely cruel are, uh, you know, violative of very basic international human rights and humanitarian law. Uh, but again, for the U.S., it's, it's very opportunistic in the way uh, it treats these things. Um, you know, in terms of the, you know, um, the similarities between uh, Northern Ireland uh, in Palestine, I think obviously there are a lot of similarities in those struggles. Um, you know, uh, Northern Ireland is not in the place that Palestine is right now, which is, of course, uh, a life and death situation. You know, the UN declared uh, a couple years ago that Gaza, for example, would be unlivable by the year 2020. Well, guess what? It's the year 2020. And it probably is unlivable, you know. Um, if there's, frankly, you know, I, you know, I wrote, wrote a whole book on this. I'm not a fan of what's called humanitarian intervention. But if there was ever a case for humanitarian intervention, it would be to protect the people of Palestine That's very from Israel. That's a really helpful way of framing it. Um, yeah. I see we've got a couple of questions coming in now. So we've got one from Connor Beaton who says, thank you all for your excellent introductions. I'd like to direct a question at, at, to Daniel Holder. The UK government has ordered a review of the judicial review process, which some have suggested is a response to the government's embarrassing defeats in Brexit lit litigation last year. You highlight that so much is at stake in the courtrooms because of reforms to the justice system in the North. Could this new UK review lead to significant backtracking on this? Yeah, I mean, that is a real serious concern. There's a whole lot of stuff in the Tory manifesto. I think it's sometimes called the page 48 constitutional reform commitments. It's very, very worrying. And one of them is this um, a commitment by the British government to review the judicial review process. And I think the backdrop to this, as you, as you highlight in your question, is that government is increasingly getting caught out, caught out in the courts acting unlawfully. The solution for that, obviously, is for government to act within the law. Um, but that's not how it sees it. What it wants to do is constrain even further 
uh, the ability to, to hold um, uh, those exercising executive powers um, within the law. Um, and it could have very, very significant implications uh, on, uh, not just on Brexit, but it's also been very, very badly caught out over, over legacy of, uh, for acting unlawfully, for failing to investigate killings and, uh, and things like that. And it has a dual strategy of both looking at judicial review, but also looking at disincorporating the uh, parts of the ECHR, which it's suing at the moment through, um, in the UK Parliament, there's what's called the Over Overseas Impunity Bill. I don't think that's its official title. It's Overseas uh, Service Personnel and Veterans Bill, which is trying to introduce a completely alien concept to UK law of a statute of limitations um, in relation to human rights violations, including torture. Um, that have come that have been committed overseas and that bill itself would actually breach the Good Friday Agreement by partially disincorporating the uh, through the Human Rights Act the, the ECHR into, into Northern Ireland law. In terms of our concerns one of the things would be uh, one of our first questions is well, will this actually apply to us because of course justice um, is a devolved area in the, in the north of Ireland so technically reforms by the UK government shouldn't apply they may well pull one of two things. Uh, one is completely ignoring their own constitutional convention. And as we found out in the Brexit case, there's no legal remedy to that at present and try and legislate on a, on a devolved issue. Or the second thing is um, they could pull the national security card um, and claim that, 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 that cases, court cases involving national security issues, which is a term not defined in UK law and tends to, 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 to Judges, both European and domestic, have thankfully placed some parameters on it. it. Tends to be rather an elastic concept because national security isn't a transfer of matter to the devolved institutions. The judicial reviews involving that content could be fiddled with within the competence of the British government. So, yeah, you're highlighting in your question something that's extremely concerning. Thanks very much. Really um, a comprehensive answer there. Um, we have another question from an anonymous attendee who says that I'm um, not a lawyer so excuse my ignorance but do you believe we are seeing a serious decline in the power of the international order particularly in the face of American neo-imperialism will conflict re conflict resolution now depend on a favorable trading relationship with the US um, so I guess Dan um, that's I suppose in theory that's directed at you uh, but I suppose if the other panelists want to also chip in after you've given a response, then they're welcome to. Yeah, well, I think it's a very good question. I think the answer is, yes, we are seeing a whittling away of international law, not by accident, by design. The U.S. in particular has been whittling away at the U.N. Charter practically since it signed on to it in 1945, right? Uh, in particular, the U.S. has been very intentional at whittling away the U.N. Charter's uh, prohibitions on aggressive war. I mean, that's really what the U.N. Charter was designed to do, to stop another world war. And so the major provisions in it are designed to prevent aggressive war, and the U.S. always opposed, well, signed on to the U.N. Charter while it helped draft it, uh, you know, beginning with the Cold War in 1948, the U.S. decided uh, it, it didn't like those prohibitions, and it has gone out of its way uh, to whittle those down. And now, as I mentioned, the U.S., you know, uh, never signed on to the international Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. The U.S. has backed out of the Human Rights Council. The U.S. has now denied the general jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice, which is the court created by the UN Charter. So yes, we are seeing uh, really a collapse of the international law system. It really is the law of, of might making right, which is exactly what the UN Charter did not want, uh, that it was designed to prevent. And so yes, you know, the way to get around this, you talked about, you know, having a favorable trading relationship with the U.S., uh, you know, which I guess to many countries, I mean, they would fully have to capitulate to the U.S., which I couldn't advise countries to do. But I think what will do it in terms of sanctions regimes, and Jeffrey Sachs, he was one of the people who did 
this report by CEPR, the one that estimated 40,000 dead in Venezuela. Uh, he's an economist at uh, Columbia University. And he was on a panel that I was on before the UN General Assembly earlier this year. And what he said was totally correct. He says, look, in the end, countries got to get off the U.S. dollar. They have to stop trading on the U.S. dollar because that's what gives the U.S. the ability to effectively sanction all these countries. And I think you're going to see that happening. I think you're going to see more countries going to the euro, to the ruble, uh, to Chinese currency, um, because they, you know, they have to. They can no longer be uh, beholden to the United States and, and held hostage by the U.S. dollar. I think the U.S. dollar will stop become being the international currency. I think that is the way for these countries to liberate themselves. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Um, Rani, I don't know if you have a view on the question. Yeah, I did want to add something to that, definitely. Um, what I wanted to add here is, and Dan mentioned a bit of this before, some of the recent U.S. measures, recent but also historic with respect to Palestine. Um, I think it's relevant also to recall here that earlier this year, in January, the U.S. administration announced its so-called deal of the century um, for a so-called resolution of the situation in Palestine. And what that plan essentially does, um, of course, is very far removed from a peace plan, as can be. Um, what it essentially does, it requires Palestinians to give up all inalienable rights. Um, it, re it certainly is not based on any fundamentals of international human rights law or even humanitarian law. And uh, it promotes and encourages further colonization um, of Palestine, including um, control over land, resources, territories, border, uh, etc. Um, so just to add here, I think it's relevant to say that despite these pressures that we are seeing, and certainly they are increasing, and they have a very important effect and impact on, on the situation for us as Palestinians, um, and that uh, includes the points that were already mentioned, including the defunding of UNRWA, the Palestine Refugee Agency, but also other measures, um, such as encouraging the current annexation attempts. And even though these do have a very important impact, I think for us, that does not discourage us from reaching out to international avenues that we know can achieve justice and accountability. And primarily, I'm mentioning here the International Criminal Court. Um, we know that the US is taking serious measures to prevent prosecution of Israeli war crimes and crimes against humanity at the ICC. Um, and yet, for us, this is still the prime uh, avenue for us to reach to, because unfortunately, in our context, there is no ability to achieve justice in local courts. Local courts are completely unwilling and unable to genuinely prosecute perpetrators, and therefore, for us, inter the International Criminal Court is truly a court of last resort. And also, it sends a very powerful political message that in fact, impunity will not be tolerated and that um, war crimes and crimes against humanity, which the prosecutor of the ICC, by the way, has already recognized are being committed in Palestine, will be held to account. Um, and this is also to mention that in the deal of the century, the so-called deal of the century, there is also a uh, provision for Palestine to renounce any, um, any, um, um, any attempts to seek justice at the ICC the ICJ and other international fora. And that for us also encourages, encourages us in saying that international justice and accountability is the way to go and it does have an impact and that is the, the reason it's being targeted in such a way. So um, I think that it is important to highlight the challenges that we are currently facing as a result of US policies, but then again also to emphasize that we are going in the right direction and we will continue to pursue these avenues. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Um, I see we've another question from Connor Beaton who asks, um, Daniel Kovalik suggests that the US courts could become a venue for international law cases as the US government eschews the likes of the ICJ and the ICC. But why should we believe that litigation in the US courts can be successful, especially when there is often such a strong bipartisan consensus in the US on many matters of international politics? the expropriation of Sitgo, and even the eviction of Maduro government officials from the Venezuelan embassy in Washington, D.C., appears to illustrate that U.S. foreign policy trumps the rule of law. 
Yes, well, again, another great question. Uh, I certainly think there's reason to have skepticism for the, all the reasons you said. Uh, and in fact, there is something called the political question doctrine in the U.S. where a court will punt and essentially say, well, we're not going to deal with this issue because it's really should, this is really in the discretion of the executive branch, right? So I think you're kind of touching on that um, sort of thing. At the same time, uh, the courts in the U.S. are not monolith. Uh, you have very progressive judges in different courts. And so what you would try to do is bring a case, for example, in San Francisco, which is in the Ninth Circuit, which is a very progressive circuit, and hope you get decent judges. I mean, sadly, we're supposed to have a rule of law and not a rule of people, right? But that's not how it works out. <laughs> so you would do some form shopping and, uh, you know, maybe have a chance. I agree that, you know, there's going to be all sorts of hurdles to that, political hurdles. Uh, but again, I at least see it as another arrow in the legal quiver to try to fight these types of things. Because again, at least the U.S., the executive branch generally listens to the courts here. We still have some semblance of a rule of law. Um, uh, but there's certainly the, the executive branch is not paying attention to the ICC or the ICJ. So it's another tool. And again, it would be a matter of finding the judges, you know, who you think might be sympathetic. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Um, I think that brings us to the end of our, um, the time we'd allotted for the event uh, and brings the Q&A to a close. I don't know if it's sensible for us to just end by offering the panelists an opportunity to give us their kind of final thoughts by way of brief conclusion. And I suppose specifically, if you can, I don't want to in any way in in encroach on your freedom to, um, to summarize your contribution in, in whatever way you see fit. But obviously what we're trying to do at London Learning Cooperative and the Materialist Lawyers Group by creating this space is to try to look, as I've said, for similarities as well as differences between these different um, struggles, these different contexts. So perhaps um, in handing over to you to conclude, you guys can um, can try to, to touch on that. Um, I don't know, uh, Daniel um, Holder, if you, can, um, if you can kick us off with your closing thoughts. Yeah, look, um, it was, uh, I mean, it's inspiring and depressing always to hear the, the, the detail from other jurisdictions and, and some of the, 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 the more recent developments. And I mean, some of the parallels, some of the differences, yes, but some of the parallels are, are quite astonishing. Um, I think all we have to do is, uh, is ourselves continue to cooperate and build solidarity between and learning between us in the sense that um, certainly the, the governments and various other agencies of oppression are, are, are cooperating quite extensively, as we've seen from some of the similarities of, of, of patterns of human rights violations in the, in the distinct jurisdictions. And this thing of, uh, in particular, of the failure to abide by international law is something that, I, that has just gone through all three presentations in our sense. It's the, it's the peace treaties, the Good Friday Agreement, the St. Andrews Agreement. And the Good Friday Agreement is lodged with the UN. It's a peace treaty. It's key weaknesses, the, the lack of a dispute resolution mechanism, lack of a mechanism to, to, to enforce it. Um, so, so I think, I mean, one big takeaway is just this issue of the importance of international law and the importance of being effective and, and accessible, which it certainly isn't at the moment in, in any of the cases that we've set out. Brilliant. Uh, Dan, I don't know if we can hear from you next. Yeah, I mean, I would echo what Daniel is saying. I mean, I think uh, what binds our talks and these issues, I think, is that we understand we have to rebuild international law and the force of international law. I think as lawyers, if that's what we accomplish, that would be amazing. I mean, this could not be a world in which, uh, you know, the poor and the weak suffer uh, and uh, the, the wealthy nations like the United States, like the UK, get their way simply by force. And that, that's what we're seeing. Um, I would say as uh, an American that uh, 
the other thing that unites all these issues is that the U.S. really is the rogue state in the world and needs to be brought to heel. And again, it needs to be subject to international law, and that is a struggle that I think all of us uh, need to be committed to. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, and then finally, Rania, um, if you want to have the last word there. Sure. Thanks to everyone. I think that was really interesting, and I was happy to hear from everyone on the different experiences that you have as well. Um, for for me, maybe to wrap up, I think that for us, uh, it certainly is an issue of enforcement of the rule of law and international law. And uh, we think that accountability is the way forward. It's the only way to bring an end to the violations as they currently exist. It's the only way to ensure um, that the law is upheld, but also that impunity is brought to an end. So really, I think that also somehow binds all the different uh, contexts, the need for justice and accountability to end impunity and ensure that, um, that human rights violations that are institutionalized are actually addressed um, at the root. And so for us, I mean, I think um, really, really addressing the different points that were mentioned today, um, I think it's, it's relevant to say that the, these root causes really need to be addressed uh, if we are to bring an end to situations of impunity. For us in Palestine, that would really be the message. So no, there are no short-term solutions or mid-term solutions. They have to start with the root of the problem. And um, when these roots are addressed and accountability is ensured, then we can start moving forward. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Rania. Uh, and thank you to, um, to all of you who've attended. Uh, and as I've said, the event was recorded and we'll upload it to uh, YouTube shortly. Really grateful to all of the panelists in particular for putting so much time and thought into your contributions tonight and for fielding the questions so comprehensively. Um, and I suppose I'll, um, yeah, I'll leave it, um, I'll leave it there, but I hope to see you at a, a similar event um, like this one in the future where we continue to try to forge these uh, meaningful organic ties of solidarity between peoples uh, around the globe who are, who are facing uh, imperialism, colonialism, oppression, so that we can try to create a space in which to collectively emancipate ourselves. Um, thanks very much for attending and I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thanks everyone. See you now. Bye-bye. Thank you everyone. Appreciate it. Cheers.